Hello and welcome to Redesign Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Annegret Böhnemann, and in this episode, I meet Nina Müller, who leads the Ethical Commerce Alliance, an initiative by Empathy.co, a company headquartered in Spain. I first heard about Nina from my colleagues in Munich and Berlin, who work with Empathy's ethical search solution and client projects, a search engine that leaves people the control over their own data. Well, really? Users retain control over their own data? Well, you could guess this got my attention. Since Nina is a podcaster as well, we thought, why don't we record an episode together, exploring together what design can do to better protect people's privacy. And that's exactly what we did. In this episode, I will be both a host to Nina and I will be interviewed by Nina. We will stream this episode on both podcasts, so not only here on Redesign, but also on the podcast Humanizing Technology. Long story short, let's dive in. Enjoy our conversation. Hi, welcome to the show, Annegret. And great to be part of your show, too. This, <laughs> <laughs> this is something new. But first, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Nina, for having me. And thanks also for uh, being with us on Redesign Podcast. Well, so some words about myself. I, I'm a designer by trade, and I'm working at the moment at For Union Customers in Amsterdam. And with my team, we're looking at how we can create more responsible tech. So for instance, more sustainable, accessible or privacy respecting websites. Sounds great. Tell me a bit more about your background, where you come from and why you feel the necessity to take on responsibility within society for your work. Well, like some years ago, I moved from Germany to the Netherlands to study social design. That was my master's studies. And I was really curious to learn about what design can do to society. So what is design all about? Because if you look around, our world is heavily designed. Take a house, for instance. The design of the space influences the behaviors and the interactions of people living in there. Or a chair that makes you sink in and thus defines your body posture. Or an app that makes you scroll down endlessly and forget about time. So design is shaping our reality, and that's design in terms of an outcome or the artifact like the chair, the book, or a website. But it's also the process of designing, which is characterized by the many considerations and decisions that you take along the way. So that's why in my eyes, being a designer comes with quite some responsibility, because design decisions have an impact on people. And of course, also the planet. Think of the materials used to build a car or the electricity that a website needs to run. Sounds super interesting. So many fields to look into. Uh, right. Yeah, it's a very versatile <laughs> um, a job that you have. But tell me how your podcast fits into that. What's the main reason for having it and what goals do you pursue? All right. Well, it's not a coincidence that the, this podcast started uh, from within For Junior Customers. Because at For Junior Customers, we place great value on learning. So to continuously develop ourselves and also our customers. And one of our favorite ways to do this is to participate in conversations and dialogues because it opens new perspectives. And that's exactly what we're doing with this podcast, right? We're speaking with people that can offer new perspectives, starting and circling around a specific topic that we are curious about and which can help us to create technology that is more responsible. So to adapt to the challenges of our time, so to say. But the major difference maybe between a normal conversation and the one in this podcast is that we open up our conversations and invite also other people to listen to it and to, to learn from them as well. But Nina, maybe can I turn the microphone over to you because I'm also curious and my, my audience probably as well. Um, I know that you are part of empathy.co and in there you lead the initiative that is called the Ethical Commerce Alliance. What is that all about? Well, the Ethical Commerce Alliance is a brand new initiative that we created. It is um, both an amplification as an extension of Empathy's core principles of trust, understanding and joy. Empathy as a company offers search and discovery solutions. And this um, means that we have an influence um, on the way we interact or the way the users interacts with the website and um, the search results that they are seen. This means we have a responsibility here beyond our economic goals, and we want to express this responsibility with the Eth Ethical Commerce Alliance 
as a platform to find knowledge and guidance and how to protect your privacy and personal data for both businesses, but also for individuals. Maybe can we dive in a little bit deeper into the name of this alliance? Because it is called Ethical Commerce Alliance. And that makes me wonder, is that even possible? Can commerce be ethical? Yeah, it does sound contrary, right? But it's not. Um, we are putting the human at the center and don't regard them as just a set of data. The human owns their own data as part of their identity, the personal data, and not the website owns it that they that the people visit. Um, unfortunately, this is not the current way um, the um, it is used online. Personal data can still be collected without proper or explicit consent, or at least not in the way GDPR originally intended it. You're more notched into an acceptance with shiny accept all buttons or not being shown the full extent of what you're accepting too, which is not possible at this point. Um, but at the same time, it is highly unethical and bears lots of risk for our, for our society and for the way we treat each other also in the offline world. And this is why we see this as an obligation to take action, to change this from our business perspective. So in case of the search engine solution that empathy.co offers, what differentiates such a solution from those by other tech providers? So first of all, we reject trackers. You will not find any on our website. Our platform is built in a way that we do not store any personal data if we we use read only if we can avoid cannot avoid it otherwise. Um, our tools are enabled to create beautiful and personalized search experiences. Our goal is to establish trust in the customer, and trust can only be established by giving trust, which means by giving them back control of their data and let the people have the user give the choice, give them the choice of what data, personal data they wish to share. That's super interesting. It makes me wonder, um, can, can you say that this is a viable model for businesses? So is it possible to still earn enough money and run a healthy, financially sustainable business? Well, companies have become accustomed to taking and using this data for their own gain. And we as users see this as the normal practice, uh, but it doesn't have to be like this. In fact, this shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't be. It is, it's not normal. Uh, with our products, we are shaking up the industry. We are changing the perception and are showing that we can achieve economic success and protecting privacy as an actual advantage by letting go of all the data. When you, for example, go shopping in, in, the, in the mall, in a shop in real life, you don't want any person following you um, advertising you the products that you've looked at. That that would be creepy if someone's following you at all. <laughs> But this is what's happening online. Well, so in your podcast, Humanizing Te Technology, you interview people who are concerned with data ethics and privacy. What's been some of the most important takeaways for you? Well, each episode is quite unique and uh, it has... Um, Gains, I gain always lots of new insights and, and learn so many things. For example, in the last episode, I talked to Pernille Tranberg from Data Ethics EU in, uh, in Denmark, and we talked about digital sovereignty. We really took the deep dive and didn't know much about it before. So that was super interesting. Or I also talked to the founder and CEO of Privacy Cloud. Uh, a company specialized in privacy first at Techmartic Solutions. And we talked about zero party data, or I talked about um, data protection in a company at um, uh, Tudoc, a digital transformation agency um, in, in Hamburg. And Michael Wolf explained how the uh, data protection um, requirements beyond the legal requirements are being set up and, and how the awareness is held up, even though it sounds like a dry topic, it was very interesting because they deal with lots of sensitive uh, customer data, everyday personal data, uh, and have to uh, take certain steps uh, to protect those. Okay, Annegret, but now you, um, it's your turn. Um, <laughs> I have some questions um, for you too. When discussing privacy, design is always a part of that. 
Can you explain a little bit more about the role that design plays and can play to enable privacy? Um, let me draw the picture a little bit bigger first. So look, design manifests a company's identity, values, and also its business model, right? If a company wants to make money by using people's personal data, then the design team will receive respective goals and it will start working towards that. So in other words, the definition of success is going to drive the decisions of a designer. You can view it like this. Designers work in the middle of a spider web of, of stakeholders, like maybe users, maybe the planet, but definitely business people. And usually the business stakeholders have a very powerful role in all of this, as they need to ensure the financial sustainability of the business and they expect the product to achieve a certain return on investment. So an online shop, for instance, is expected to sell well. And ultimately, the design of that online shop will surface whether the company cares for topics like accessibility, environmental sustainability, or like you also say, privacy. Is the shop made to sell as much as possible? Can people with disabilities use it? Does it respect people's privacy? Well, I'm going to be able to tell by the design of the shop. In summary, the way we act and react as humans plays an important role. How can design influence or even manipulate our behavior? Well, we essentially speak about privacy by design, which is an approach to reduce privacy risk and build trust. So earlier you mentioned the example of cookies. Many of us know the famous cookie banners that disturb us as soon as we open a website. So now the design might offer different options. Something like you said already, accept all or reject all, or maybe accept all only essential cookies. So maybe you find these three options when you open a website. One of the first things to consider as a designer is actually, what is the default? Is there a default? You will typically see the accept all option is going to be colored and it's going to be highlighted in a way yes. um, that the reject button uh, is maybe grayed out and stepping a bit into the background. Well, okay, so what will people click on? Well, obviously, they are nudged to click on accept all. So the design is guiding them towards that decision. So the design is manipulating people in that moment to click on a specific choice that the business appreciates. Yes, this is what I said before, right? It's the designer's responsibility and it's the software uh, development responsibility, like how we act and interact. Um, I like that. It's That's a great overlap in our work here. Yeah, right. That, that, that's where the designer can step in, right? And I must say it really depends on the project. It depends on the team and the business goals, like, like I said before. So the definition of success. But for example, as a designer, I can propose alternative solutions. So I can make a solution. I can design and sketch out a solution that makes all options appear in the same way. So that accept all, reject all, and accept only essential cookies is going to be all maybe gray, for instance. That solution, that option would be less guiding and it would leave more agency to the users. So sometimes it's just sketching out an alternative can help people to think in a different direction. Another way that I like to do is also really to step up in conversations with my, my stakeholders because I, as a designer, work pretty close to the people who are going to use a product. So I'm very often very aware of the consequences of a design because I get the feedback more directly, while business stakeholders might have a different reality in their day-to-day -day work. So they might not even hear this sort of feedback. So I can bring this feedback more closer to them. And in case of the cookie example, for instance, what I would do is maybe to question my team do we really need this data? What is it for? Is it really that essential? <laughs> and if the answer is no on this, we might not even start designing this cookie banner. Maybe we can drop them all together, right? Not at this moment in time, I assume. <laughs> But if the answer is yes, I can still take another step there because I can, I can sit together with my team and make sure we identify the problems as quick as, uh, as, quick as possible in the process. So For instance, I could suggest user testing, or I could also suggest a dark reality session. That's, that's a session where in a team you could reflect about what's the worst case that could happen if we design this in this way. So just to name a few of the considerations you could take. Oh yeah. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> so it, 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 so there's a lot of work to be done before even picking up 
the pencil and start the drawing or doing the layout of the very first uh, steps in the design? Almost definitely, yes, because in the end, the, the outcome, the artifact is only what is in the end, the surface of the entire design process, right? So there's the outcome that makes visible the process and all the decisions that have been taken before. Yeah, it's so funny. So what you see and take for granted um, doesn't reflect really um, all all the uh, the thought processes uh, that have been put into this to make it look so easy and smooth. It also sounds to me, correct me here if I'm wrong, but that it's um, design is a lot about leaving out and reducing, finding clarity um, in in what you make to enable people. Um, because I think it, it also has a lot to do with empathy. Like how would a person who is not a designer and who is not very, um, well, fluent in the internet, if you want to say, if you can say that, um, can still um, have a beautiful, uh, experience user experience. Yeah, exactly. So what we essentially speak about in that specific example is digital literacy, right? So um, it is important as a designer also to consider people with different levels of literacy of using the internet and digital devices. So it is also my role to to make it possible for, for not only the master, the superpower users, but also for those who are still in the learning process, so to say. And then if we think about the topic of privacy, what are the consequences of hitting the button accept all? Well, if you're very familiar with the internet and you've seen that all over the place, you, you, you might be okay in hitting that and you might be fine if your data is being tracked. But if you are maybe not that familiar, you might question this a lot. It might cause you anxiety because you don't actually know what is happening. So all this terminology that sits behind and all that, it, it might have a different impact on a person that is not so familiar with, with uh, the digital world. A little bit as a designer, you also have to be a futurist to um, not to make predictions, but to anticipate um, how people react to that and and interact. Also, besides predicting, I mean, of course, there's there's um, best practices, right, that you can rely on. But also, it's always good to to actually test, test and test, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, make different variations, bring them out there, test it with people, what is going What is going well, what is it that people are concerned about, what is it that scares them off. Um, testing is really a super nice way in figuring out what is the right design to go forward with. I have one last question, um, and then we're already at the end of this conversation, uh, I must say, and tell me about, about uh your your work and your role at your and your customers, how that fits into your daily work and um, your for you and your customers uh, philosophy and, and principles. Well, one of my drivers in working in this area is that I let's, let's say I have my inner moral compass, <laughs> and that one is on if I'm at work, but it's also on after I finish my work or before I start my work. So. Essentially, for me, it is important to, to bring my values into my work. And I think for you and your customers, it's a company that really appreciates that also, because we are a value-driven company. We are not um, per se profit-driven, by example. We are looking at how can we return to society. Um, one of the things that we're doing is um, to, for instance, exhibit arts in our offices. And arts is a beautiful way of, of slowing down, of uh, wondering, of thinking about the world in a, in a broader scale, of learning new perspectives and of self-reflecting also. And I think self-reflection, for instance, is really a big part of my job because taking all these considerations and being able to reflect upon a design solution really means that you have to be able to reflect and you have to be able to question. And I think that is something that um, for you and your customers is also really very much about. So you, we were speaking about ethical uh, commerce and you, you were also reflecting that that is something that is definitely possible if you choose for it. If you have a business that is um, oriented towards ethical goals, so if you have an ethical standard that you want to live upon, um, does that change the way you work? Is your day-to-day -day work different than maybe in a job that you had beforehand? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, ethical standards have a lot to do with, um, with your personality, with the standards that you set for yourself. And um, being able to exercise that in a company who is so driven 
by its values and and by s- such strong principles is for me personally a great gift and um working in a company that um does things a little differently is um i think important because we really have an actual chance to 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 make things better thank you so much nina i think that's that's a beautiful way of ending because i think that is also really what 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 brings us together in the end that we are really trying to to make a bit of a ditch into this world and to make a change some, something that brings us forward and that hopefully leaves us uh, with with a better future absolutely thank you anna grid so that's it this was our episode with nina miller from empathy.co thanks for listening and we hope that you enjoyed And if you'd like to know more about the topic, please check the description of this episode where you can find some resources. And if you'd like to listen to more talks of this kind, you can subscribe to our podcast to not miss any future episode. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day.